Hello, Malcolm Brady here I want, uh, from Dublin City University. I want to talk to you today about competitor analysis. So this is a mid-range set of analysis tools between uh, analyzing the industry and analyzing the firm itself. So we're looking at individual competitors, so we're, we're going to name the firms here, not industry analysis, where you're looking at the industry in general. We're looking at individual competitors here, and there's a number of techniques I want to bring you through. Um, uh, the first one is, um, excuse me, first one is Michael Porter's, uh, often referred to as his uh, SOAR model, using the acronym SOAR, which is for strategy, objectives, assumptions, and resources and capabilities. So again, just four headings under which you're going to analyze your close competitors. Um, <clears throat> obviously, you don't have information or full information about your competitors, but you may have access to some information. For example, you won't necessarily know their, their strategy, but we have mentioned in the past in previous um, video clips that um, you can infer strategy from the pattern of decisions made in the past by entities, by organizations. So if you look at competitors and you look at their pattern of decisions from the past, you may be able to infer their particular strategy from that. It doesn't guarantee it's going to be that way into the future, but it should give you a good indication. Firms are slow enough to change their fundamental strategy. The nature of strategy is that it's not easy to change. So looking at past decisions and inferring back may give you the strategy. The objectives of the organization, they may declare those on their website or in their <clears throat> annual reports if they're, if they're publicly available. Um, they may declare them in. PR messages and so on out to the public. So again, gathering information on all of that can provide you with the objectives of the different firms. Similarly, with the assumptions under which they're working, their, their fundamental assumptions, their, their principles, their guiding values and so on, um, you may be able to get that from publicly available information as well. Uh, you may have other sources of information. You may be able to infer those from, again, from the decisions they actually do make, you may be able to infer the underlying assumptions under which they operate. And the resources and capabilities may be, may be available to, um, to you anyway. Again, some of that is, is, is available publicly, maybe in a disguised version through industry bodies and so on, who gather information about firms um, and compile them into information about the industry as a whole. And again, you may be able to gather information about competitors from those kind of sources. So once you've done that, you now have quite a deal of information about your competitors. And the, the idea is that doing this in a formal way should give you, put you in a better position uh, than just <clears throat> knowledge that you're picking up by the by. Senior management generally are pretty aware of their competitors anyway, and will often have a fairly good feeling about this, but systematically sitting down and working it out also provides extra value and it's worth doing that um, every, every so often. Um, so you're, as, as I mentioned, you're trying to identify what their current strategies and current positions are, and in particular, what their next moves are going to be and who will be the major players into the future. Um, it's worth, too, going back to your industry analysis here and consider what substitutes might be uh, out there for, your, for the products of your industry and consider the advent of substitutes. Um, they may be your next competitors, so it's worth checking them out. Similarly, any new potential new entrants as well that you've identified from, or the, you'd have identified the threat of new entrants from your um, five forces analysis. And if it's a reasonably high threat, you might want to identify who might in particular be those companies that are considering entering and um, assess those as well. Okay. And finally, you're working out here the implications for your own firm. You know, you, you, you know the strengths now of the different competitors, you know what they're you have some sense of what they're what you think they might do and uh, who will be the major players in the industry how does this affect you and what are you going to do what's your response okay so that's your your first the first technique that i'm speaking about competitor analysis and it's the SOAR acronym strategy objectives strategy objectives assumptions and resources capabilities so that's the acronym to help you remember that particular analysis technique very simple technique, nothing too complicated about this. Although gathering the data can be, um, you know, it's not always that it's not always that easy and will require systematic work. Okay. <clears throat> the next technique then is okay. Um, stop the screen share and. to go back to um,
going to go back, back to um, sharing my screen in a general fashion because um, Zoom still does this. It catches it. It hangs on. Um, it hangs when you're using the slide, the um, actual presentation mode. Okay, so I'm going to just use this format here. So we've looked at uh, the competitor analysis, uh, the SOAR model. So our next model is um, is the and is analyzing competitive strength of each firm. So this is a little bit more systematic, a little bit more. Um, precise as we're putting numbers on each on, on these elements and scoring our firm against our competitors and seeing how we stand up in that particular fashion. So we've looked at the competitors in isolation. Now we're going to look at them collectively and benchmark ourselves against our competitors. So to do this, we're, we're going to use some factors or other. We have to use some dimensions under which to compare. And the key success factors that we determined from the industry analysis, you can recall, after you know, the outcome of our industry analysis is what are the key factors for success in this industry? So there are the ones where, you know, they make, it makes sense to use those in terms of our competitive strength analysis. So for this example here, we've identified six key success factors for the industry, product quality, brand image, customer service, operating costs, technical expertise, and R&D, okay? And these are, these are just fictional companies, just numbers I, I made up. So there's nothing special about these, but it indicates the technique. So we've scored, each company, company A, B, and C against each of these factors. And for company A, it comes out at eight under product quality. Company B comes out at six under the heading of product quality. Company C is obviously a, a laggard here and only, only comes out with three under product quality, okay? And again, we've gathered data to support these figures. So you've gone to uh, industry bodies, industry boards, any industry information to kind of determine product quality. You may have carried out surveys of customers to determine our product, to determine product quality or focus groups of customers. You may have used your own managerial judgment in, in determining these and in the, indeed in determining what factors to use in the first place. Um, and you may have talked with various stakeholders or gathered information from various stakeholders about to, to gather, to, to, to back up these figures. So they're not just simply plucked out of the air. You, you do have to do a, quite a deal of work to get, um, to get these figures in place and to be able to do this um, comparison. So anyway, we simply, for this example here, we're simply adding up the scores for each of the headings. And we see that company A comes out at 45, Company B comes out at a score of 42, and Company C comes out at a score of 26. So under this, um, in, from this analysis, we see that Company A would be the strongest firm in the industry. I'm not sure which your firm is. Uh, say you were Company C, well, you would, you would be, you'd have a lot to do here, okay? Uh, some areas, R&D, for example, you're way behind. So you, that's an area you might need to look at, okay? So uh, you look at your company, you look at the competitors, and you compare them. The next slide is a similar analysis, but this time we're using a weighted average, a weighted uh, calculation. So in this case, we have the same uh, firms, same uh, raw scores as the last time. These three columns here are the raw, raw scores and same uh, key success factors, so same dimensions that we're measuring the firm against. Okay, except this time now we're distributing, let's say the weight, uh, sorry, the the importance of each factor, uh, where we're using a weight to indicate the importance of each factor. These weights uh, sum up to um, one, okay? And they indicate which factor is important, which are not. So we can see here that 0.3 out of one. So this, this operation cost counts for close to 30% or actually 30% of the weighting. So this is the most important factor in your uh, view, okay? And again, managerial judgment would be important here. It's unlikely you're gonna get that information from a, um, so by gathering data, you, you have to form a view on this. So a managerial judgment is critical here. Um, the next most important factor is product quality at 0.2 or 20% of the total weight. The least important factor here is brand image in this industry for whatever reason. It's brand isn't important. So it's very given very little weight here. Okay, so now we, we do our new calculation. So in this case, we multiply the raw score by the weighting to get the, the weighted score. So eight times 0 0.2 is 1.6. So that gives us a weighted score of 1.6. Similarly, six times 0 0.2 is 1.2. And that's our weighted score. And for company C, uh, three times 0 0.2 is 0 0.6 is the weighted score. So we now have a new set of scores. 
So we compute these weighted scores for each dimension for each firm. And we get these columns here, this column here for company B, and this column here for company C. And we now have a new weighted score. So 6.8 for company A, 7.05 for company B, 4.9 for company C. Okay, so not, you know, the difference between them isn't, it doesn't look as bad here as it did in the original analysis, the raw score analysis. The other interesting thing here is that um, company B comes out on top here when you use a weighted average because it obviously is scoring quite well in, for example, operating costs. And if we're regarding that as the most important of the key success factors, it gets a high score in here. So that, that's probably the element that made the difference here. So now we have company B coming out as an industry leader. And um, obviously, if you want to get a particular result, you can choose to massage these figures, changing the weights and the, indeed even the scorings to get the, the company you want coming out on top. But that's not the point of the exercise. That's just playing games with the technique, okay? If you do it post hoc, you know, where you, 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 you've already made your decision as to which is the top company in the industry and you're just using the figures to kind of confirm that you're post hoc rationalizing and not recommended to do that, okay? It's, that's really just gaming. Um, but if you use it correctly and you actually genuinely determine the factors, the weightings and the uh, raw scores and you use the technique, it will, it will give you, you know, good information, precise information about your view of the industry and how the competitors stack up. Okay, so that's competitive strength analysis. Our next technique now is um, strategic group mapping, which again is is uh, looking at uh, the industry as a whole, looking at each competitor in the industry. And we're, instead of using a table to kind of compare the competitors, we're actually using a, a graph, a graphic, okay? So we're, we're <clears throat> distributing the competitors across this um, graphical space here, two-dimensional space. In this case, in this example here, one of the dimensions is quality or image. And the second dimension is geographic coverage. And again, these would likely be coming out as either key factors for the industry or key characteristics of the industry. And you're rating the different firms along these characteristics or dimensions. Okay, you'll note here that there's two dimensions. In the previous example, we used six different dimensions. Here, we're just using two because graphs, get, these kind of charts get difficult to interpret if you have more than two because you're into three dimensions and four dimensions. And generally, we're not that well equipped to um, recognize information from three dimensions and certainly not from four because we can't even depict it graphically, okay? Um, <clears throat> but if we restricted, say, two dimensions, probably the two most important dimensions that you imagine for the industry, and then again, plot each firm. So we, if you use the previous technique, you've already got scores for each dimension for each firm. So now you simply plot, you know, so for example, Coors here is, is um, over medium, just, you know, about halfway up, say 0.5 in terms of quality image, and then say 0.4 in terms of national or local cover. So it's a regional operator here in the middle, and you plot Coors on that. Um, this is, say, the US brewing industry, okay? This is taken from a textbook a number of years ago, so it's probably a little dated, but it illustrates the, the way the technique works. Miller exam for here is pretty well the same as Coors in terms of quality image, but much greater coverage than Coors, okay? Hence, it's plotted to the right of the Coors in the course plot. You can represent the size of the firm using the um, using the circle here as a representative of say revenue <coughs> of the firm. And in that case, you can see that AB and Anheuser-Busch is by far the largest firm in the industry. So it gives you information about where the industries lie in on the dimensions and it gives you information about the size of the industry. And also it's called strategic group mapping. It gives you information about what firms cluster together so your closer competitors tend to be the ones that are clustering together on this graph, on this strategic group mapping, okay? So Anheuser-Busch and Miller are obviously close competitors here, along with some imports, Heineken and Carlsberg and so on. These would tend to be close competitors. And then boutique firms, boutique beers would be close competitors in their, in their own areas, but because they're very localized, they may not be all competing in the same area. Okay, so this the strategic group map clusters firms and, and indicates which, um, which are your close competitors and they're the ones you're most likely going to be competing with and be want to be aware of, okay? Um, the 
strategic group mapping, uh, people who first looked at this um, pointed out that it's actually quite difficult to um, mo move between strategic groups. There are mobility barriers between groups similar to entry barriers into industries in the first place. So you very much do compete with your, with your group and uh, it's difficult to shift groups. So it's just again, to be aware of that. Um, obviously, uh, you want to um, use dimensions that expose the differences between the firms and the industries. And I've mentioned already the, the most, most important or most critical dimensions tend to be the ones you will use for this. You can, of course, draw many different maps using different combinations of pairs of dimensions. Okay, So you could draw two or three different maps of the same industry, just choosing different dimensions and see where you stack up. In other words, does your strategic group change when the dimensions change? Okay. All right. Um, I've mentioned here Gartner's Magic Quadrants is an example of a, of a strategic group mapping carried out by an industry commentator, Gartner Group, who comment on the IT industry. And other industry bodies tend to draw these kind of diagrams to represent their industry. Um, and you, 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 you probably, you may be aware of these from your industry, or certainly when you go into work in industry, you will be, you become aware of the group mapping. They may not call it that; they call it by different names. As I say, Gartner used the phrase magic quadrants, but essentially they're a clustering technique using two dimensions and to plot geographically, or sorry, to plot, to plot graphically the position of the firm in, in the, on the chart and then to see which firms cluster closely together. So as I say, they're called different names, but they, they are broadly speaking, this type of strategic group mapping technique. Uh, next slide actually shows one of the, uh, uh, version of one of the magic quadrants for the meeting solutions industry uh, carried out by Gartner Group. Uh, and if you have the slides deck, you can click here to get access to the, the to that mapping. Uh, otherwise, you can just click on Gartner Group magic quad quadrant for meeting solutions and you should get to it. But anyway, you'll see here again, they use two dimensions here. They call one dimension ability to execute. Second dimension is completeness of vision. And Gartner do this for all the different industries. They tend to use these two dimensions for all the industries uh, within IT, the sort of components of IT that they, that they um, component industries in IT that they, that they um, observe. And you can see here, uh, they, they use this, they entitle this quadrant, the leader quadrant. So these are firms that are high in level of completeness of solution and high in terms of ability to execute, okay? And the, hence the leadership positions. And in this case, it's Microsoft, Cisco, and Zoom. Um, <laughs> If you're listening to this, you're you're benefiting from from Zoom at the moment, uh, in terms of the recording. Um, challengers, Google, Logmain, Huawei, and then visionaries will be high in terms of vision, but not so high in terms of ability to execute. So these are probably new firms developing, not yet fully um, strong enough to execute that well, but but have a very good vision. Okay, the challengers here are ones that are actually very good in terms of uh, ability to execute. So they have, a, they have a good offering, but it might be limited in some fashion or other. Okay, so you can see anyway, you're, you're, you're getting a good sense of the industry here and the particular competitors, you're naming particular competitors in this technique. And then you can see where you lie. If you're um, Huawei, we can see where Gartner uh, pitch you in terms of this uh, model. And then you can see what you might have to do to shift into a leadership position or to hold your position here or whatever it is you wish to do. Okay, but it'll give you information. And then the final technique, again, we're going back to dimensions again. In this case, um, we're using multiple dimensions. So more akin to the competitive, competitive strength analysis there we're using here. They've actually got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 dimensions that they're measuring the various firms against. Okay, And you can see they're using a kind of a, a, a graph here to indicate the strength of the different firm on the different dimensions. So this comes from Kim and Moburn and their value innovation model or blue ocean strategy model. Um, <clears throat> and they take their, their particular example they were taking was Cirque du Soleil and they're plotting Cirque du Soleil on these dimensions against traditional competitors in that industry in the kind of circus uh, spectacle industry. Okay. And um, you can see straight away uh, that they, they are, um, much lower in some dimensions here. And indeed, they're, they're pretty well eliminated these dimensions from their business. So this is the rubric that um, Kim and Moburn offer, um, create, raise, reduce, and eliminate. And it was each dimension or each aspect of the, the business. You can choose to um, raise the level of it 
reduce the level of it, eliminate it entirely, or indeed create new aspects uh, altogether, uh, which indeed Cirque du Soleil have done. I'll come to that in a moment. Um, so you're, you're looking, you're getting a at a glance, you're getting quite a lot of information about the firm and about the competitors in the firm. And you can see where they're lower, could be argued weaker, or in this case, they've decided just not to compete on those dimensions, and indeed where they're higher. And here, they've created these new dimensions for the industry that, that didn't exist before. So these are just Cirque du Soleil, a theme to the spectacle, a kind of a, a co cohesive theme to the, to the entirety of the spectacle, refined, much improved watching environments, seating and auditorium and so on. Um, music and dance, they've introduced that into the offering as well. Okay, so much more of a spectacle than old fashioned circus. Okay, so these are new themes, okay, or new dimensions brought in. So they've created these new dimensions. So you can see here that this technique uh, in the Kim and Mober model is not just simply to represent the industry and see where you stack up against your competitors, but as a way of creating a new strategy and um, it's a strategizing tool as much as an, anal an analysis tool. So Cirque du Soleil have identified new dimensions that they compete on. They've ident identified certain dimensions, animal shows, star performance, concessions in the aisle that they don't do at all. So they have removed those. Um, and then in certain other ones, they have raised the, um, the level. So they, they, in terms of the venue, their venue is much higher quality than the venues of the standard circus operators here. So they've raised this value substantially here, very, very substantially. They've raised the price. You can see that here, that dimension is also raised. Um, and in terms of dimensions they've reduced, you can see here, they're a little bit lower than the, say, certainly the, the, the various other firms, Barnum and Bailey and um, the smaller circuses. They're a bit lower than these in terms of fun and humor and in terms of thrill and challenge. So they rate themselves lower than them in those dimensions but higher um, uh, these dimensions here and this dimension here. Um, so all in all, you're getting this visual view of the firm. You're getting, um, you, you can also use it, as I say, as it means a strategizing, creating, considering what new dimensions you might work on and what dimensions you might just eliminate altogether. And whether they have made the right call on these or not, well, the performance of the firm will, will bear that out one way or the other. So in time, you will know whether this was a, you know, a good idea and a good idea here or whether it wasn't okay <clears throat> a final mention of this technique is it it, it, it again goes under uh, other names uh, oberholzer gee brings out a model that he calls the value map which you, very similar technique to this he tends to use a, a, a tends to set up ver vertically rather than uh, horizontally as, as done here but it's pretty well the same technique where you take the dimensions of the industry and you graph graphically rate each firm you plot each firm on all the dimensions and the graph that you have to interpret the graph to um, work out where you stand against your competitors. Not so easy to interpret. The competitive strength analysis gives you a, a number and a, a total that you can easily see which, which firm is higher. This isn't quite as obvious. Okay, so you need to be more careful in interpreting this kind of st strategy canvas or value map. Anyway, these are the techniques, uh, some four techniques there that we've used to um, compare, compare, to evaluate competitors and compare them with ourselves in a kind of benchmarking type fashion. Okay, thank you.